Good afternoon. I was, I'm privileged to sit in between Mr. Mokode and um, Dr. Emerson. And like um, that dull student is always spying on the work of the smart student next, next to him. I was wondering what Dr. Esso was writing. And it was uh, titled uh, Protocol List. And I thought that she would stop at the third line or the fourth line. But by the time she had exhausted some three pages, I stopped spying because I don't, I won't need it. So please, bear with me. Um, let me just uh, recognize His Excellency the Vice President, who I hope that I will meet here, uh, ably represented. And perhaps the celebrant, Dr. Fulashade Yemieson. Um, I don't know how how you cope with all these accolades coming in that direction. Why are in your situation? I will pray for the ground to open so that I can, I can vanish. And my only admonition is receive them, enjoy them, but don't become them. That's all. Um, I normally carry my courage with me wherever I go. But after all that I said about a small boy like me, I became afraid. Um, but I said to myself, okay, what I told Dr. Esso is what I'll tell myself. Receive it, just don't become it. And then um, go and do what you are meant to do. It's a graduation ceremony after all. When you read the letter that I was sent, it looked more like, sounded more like I was coming here as a professor. And I decided that I will not come here as a professor. I will come here as a happy participant in the graduation ceremony. And therefore, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I say congratulations to the 2023 lead P cohort on reaching this pivotal milestone, the successful completion of a 10-month adverse program. By the very fact of your participation in P, it is clear that your journey in the civil service has been marked by exceptionality. As we celebrate your accomplishments today, I also have the important task of talking to you, delivering a charge on strategic leadership, the essential skills. Sounds like the title of a textbook. <laughs> but I have a good idea of what your journey to this point has entailed. I will therefore like to assure you that this is not another module in the program. No, no. Nobody's going to test you after this. <laughs> But well, I hope it is one that you will find easy to follow, easy to digest, and hopefully take to heart as you carry on with your life's journey. As someone who has impacted national development through short stints of public service, largely from the private sector, I understand the weight of leadership responsibility you have been given Nigeria's challenges are unique and multifaceted, demanding not only competence, but a total commitment to transformative leadership. You have already proven yourselves regarding the former, i.e. competence. That's how you got chosen. So, I'd like to focus on how your transformative leadership can be crucial in steering Nigeria towards sustainable growth and development. Globally, civil and public servants have a weighty responsibility that transcends the fleeting cycles of governmental changes. 
You get to be architects of a nation's future, working in fields that touch millions of lives directly every day for good, but also guess what? for bad. That's why you must first and foremost cultivate an impact-driven mindset and then back it up with fundamental principles of excellence. This approach is not just about fulfilling your job description daily. No. It's about proactively seeking opportunities to create lasting change and transform lives. An impact-focused person is dedicated to the greater good. So they work in a realm where their success is measured by their positive contributions to society and not by their personal wealth. We may not talk about this often in our country, but it's not new. We have a story history of people in your position who are impact driven. Chief Simeon Adebo, Chief Jerome Udoji, and Alaji Liman Chiroma. We are all civil servants who exemplified what it meant to be truly dedicated to national transformation. For example, Alaji Chiroma's role in expanding Nigeria's university system and his tenure as head of the civil service were marked by integrity, diligence, and visionary thinking. He was committed to our country's advancement. And if you schooled in Nigeria, you, are, you likely benefited from some of his reforms. When Alaji Liman Chiroma died in 2004, decades after achieving those reforms, local and foreign newspapers eulogized him for his work in the civil service. I can say the same for Jerome Udoji, Simeon Adebo, and given the short time I've spent amongst you, and I am whispering things in my ear, if I had those information before I wrote this, I would put Ola Shade Yemir's question. But the list is not exhaustive. Nigeria has encountered, encountered so many good people. The country does not have a shortage of what to do. It just has a shortage of who to do them. And that's where we come to lead P. I didn't know all these men. I knew Malaj Liman very well. And I'm still in touch with his family. Chief Adebo and I were related, but I never met him. I knew every Nigerian of my generation, even if you didn't know Jerome Brodji, we collected some money that we put in our pocket. But their work speak for them through time, with their legacies elevated beyond those of their, of their wealthy, business-focused peers. Indeed, there is a limit to how much a legacy one can build through businesses. Honestly, and I say this as an entrepreneur myself. Your role as a civil servant, however, offers you the chance to transform a nation and change lives daily. In these former civil servants, Adebo, Doji, and Chiroma, to name but a few, we see the embodiment of an impact-driven mindset. This should be a beacon for all in service. Today, as we navigate the growing complexities of our nation, the question that looms large is, who is building on the remarkable legacy of these people? Our country is currently facing myriad challenges across sectors, from education, to help manufacturing, to infrastructure, and more. 
These are areas of high impact, demanding attention and dedicated action. Every four years, we go to the polls seeking a new Messiah. But the real need of the hour is for civil and public servants who will not only address these issues, but also lay the groundwork for a resilient, equitable, and prosperous future. Dear P graduates, will you be that person individually? Today, I want to urge you to be inspired by the example set before you and commit to preparing our country for the future. This commitment involves understanding and addressing our society's immediate needs and envisioning and implementing solutions that will have long-term benefit. It is about building robust systems, inclusive policies, and services that are accessible to all Nigerians. In doing so, we honor those who served before us and we build our own legacy as a foundation for future generations. I'd like to share a personal story about public service potential for transforming not just a sector, but millions of lives. I'd already made my name as a banker, but was also very interested in, my, in making an impact us outside entrepreneurship. So when this invitation to public service came, I decided to take it to take on the charge. At the time, Nigeria's pension balance was a staggering zero if it wasn't negative. Everything about it resided in the office of the head of service. Not very encouraging as you can see. Yet, instead of focusing on how daunting the task had been given, I focused on the impact I could make by doing something we obviously needed as a country. President Obasanjo did not set up a committee. He invited me into his office at one o'clock on the fateful day. But yeah, I had set long before that nobody delays me. If you give me a one o'clock, I will be there in time. See me at one. Otherwise, I will go back to what I was doing. Unbeknown to me, and that's Chief Ekaite, Fort Ekaite, Secretary of the Government of the Federation, to be there. He invited me to his office, and he said, for I have a problem. The President of Nigeria, to whom people were carrying problems, was telling a citizen that he had a problem. What is your problem? He said, you know I'm a soldier. I don't like seeing people queuing and dying while waiting to collect their pension. I want this pension problem sorted out. Help me. My mother had trained me that any time anybody says, help me, help the person. Okay. So without knowing what I was in for, I said to preserve us, I will help you. And he said, okay. Let me call Ufor, sent to his, the man who was hang, hanging by his door. They called him in. He said, Ufor, Ufor, give him everything that you have on pension. He's going to help me to sort it out. When will they be ready? The man said, if he comes at 3.30, I'll be ready. Then I knew he had not much of pension. Because this was about 1.15 now. He will be ready for me with everything he had on pension. I said, no problem. Uh, where are you going to work? Where are you going to stay? I said, let me even look at what I'm going to do. And I got the, as soon as I entered the man's office, another man who respected time, he just gave me, you know, they have this uh, rope that is used to tie files in civil service. He just lifted the rope like this and gave me three files. And that's all you have about pension in Nigeria? I said, yes. I went home. 
and I flipped through all the three files. It didn't even catch me. I said to myself, scratching my neck, what am I going to do? And that was how the journey began. We did what we could. And in 2004, the report which, we didn't just give President Sanjo the report, we wrote the bill. No title, no office, no nothing. We got passed into law in 2004. Wow. Occasionally, I will read in the papers pension fund assets now 10 trillion. Pension fund assets, the last time I read, 15 trillion. I just told you that there was zero when we started. That's 15 trillion somewhere. Doing more than what pension does. How will you, anybody compare that with any other thing I've done in my life? That, that, that. Okay. Don't let me get emotional of you. Fast forward to today. I just told you that the pension fund asset stand at over 15 trillion naira. This monumental growth has not just been a numerical achievement, it has formed the bedrock of our national savings. Fundamentally altering the financial landscape of our country in less than 20 years. Today, those savings are a distinguishing factor between us and our neighbors, like Ghana, or even Kenya, when the IMF will say they have very weak savings base. And it's on that that you build an economy. That is what collateral, but that is what has, has been achieved. That's what policy does. What made a difference was a well-crafted policy that addressed Nigeria's realities while envisioning a better future. I share that story to show you that the nature of the work that you, as lead P, as lead P graduates, have committed yourselves to is one of potentially immeasurable impact. Immeasurable impact. I was one man given a limited task. You are many people who get to work daily on repairing, on building, and on innovating for our nation and our people. If you embrace the impact-driven mindset Simeon Adebo and the others embody, you won't need to consciously build a legacy or seek validation for your value. Your work will speak for itself, and your work will speak for you, resonating through time and across generations. Trust me. While an impact-driven mindset is an essential part of this journey, I'd like to highlight certain principles you must imbibe to thrive in the pursuit of excellence in public service. The first two principles, integrity and accountability, are foundational. Integrity, in its essence, is about doing the right thing, even when no one is watching. It is about steadfast adhering to a code of ethical values. Accountability is about being as full and responsible for one's actions. But in managing public resources and trust. These are not just abstract ideals. They are the very foundation upon which effective governance and public trust are built. If I tell you how I describe it to myself every day, it is what my mother taught me to do. And when I get to that crossroad, I ask myself, what would my mother tell me here? That's all. So I came out of home with some of these values. But we did not need to have come out of home with it. They are also learnable. As graduates of the VP program, you have been equipped with modules like public financial management. Please do not take these modules as theoretical frameworks. They are not. Or they are, but they are more than that. 
They should become the lens through which you view every decision, ensuring transparency and efficiency. Translate them into living, breathing practices in your day-to-day -day service. Because the very high-impact sectors you work in are also high catastrophe sectors when not appropriately stewarded. I'm sure you all remember the exemplary service of Dora Kunyili during her tenure. Under our pastor's job, for a long time, until I became the chairman of the Pension Commission, and I'll tell you about that later, I didn't have a title. Not because I wasn't offered, but because I constantly declined. In your space, every time somebody is titled, the person is quantified. Including where the person is going to sit when he has a ring. So I refused to take one. But I was frequent in the villa as Professor Lao Pabule. Yeah. And I used to ask people who were in office, ministers, special advisors, palm sex, what is your job? Just, just so many people spoke grammar and at the end of the day I still not understand their job. And then I met this woman, may her soul rest in peace, Dora Akumili. I said, Dora, what's your job? For those who knew Dora, she, she, she was energy itself. You know that song, Baby Calm Down? And Dora was never calm. Every time, hyper. So that Dora said, Fola, Fola, what is my job? If, if I allow fake drugs, Fola, I am a murderer. Eh? If I sign on something wrong, Fola, I have killed children. If I, and she went on and on and on. And then I met somebody who understood her job. Uh, one of the, I met other people who understood their job, but Dora knew that if she didn't do her job properly, right, it is not limited to just not doing her job. It was supporting a, a, a mother. That, that was how she said it to me. Okay. So if you hear me talk about Dora, it was the clarity of understanding of her job. Right, what is the impact of where does this have thrown uh, uh, the sink into the ocean? Right, what's the purpose? So, if I didn't put the bait there, I'm not likely to catch any fish. That was the context in which Dora and I engaged. I'm sure you all remember the exemplary service of Dora during her ten years now. That. Our unwavering commitment to integrity and accountability was transformed for the agency and life-saving for countless Nigerians. She tackled the menace of counterfeit drugs head-on, and I mean head-on because she was also shot in the head, <laughs> demonstrating how principal leadership can bring about monumental change. Today, this is legacy is a powerful example of the impact you can make when principles are learned and embodied in your work. It is not far-fetched to see how, if such a role is compromised for personal gain, the consequences are catastrophic. Taking it to murder, in the same way, every role in the service has a profound trickle-down effect on the quality of life across Nigeria. Some might be more obvious than others, but they all do. They all do. The person in charge of education might think that is not compromising, is not joining a murderous group when he's sending less than enough to teach our children. But who do we produce? People who are useless. Whose education we ask for what purpose? Okay, they were better off not seeing the inside of school. Than coming up. You know, the person who doesn't know is clear. The person who knows half or a quarter is dangerous. It's dangerous, you know? Okay. That I'm trying to come, I hope I'm convinced you yeah. your role. Yeah. Okay. Um, therefore, 
If you are not committed to acting with integrity and accountability, the repercussions will be significant. Not only because of the failures, but also the missed opportunities for success. I urge you to let integrity and accountability guide you to make decisions that serve the greater good and uphold the trust placed in you by the citizens of our nation. To these first principles, let me add the pursuit of knowledge. And I think Professor Lopa has piled on my paper. He has talked about knowledge. It will be indispensable for the effective leadership and decision making. Regardless of your postings in the coming years, each area will require a deep understanding and an openness to continual learning. There is no limit. There is no limit on knowledge. Let me tell you how I say to my children, the more I learn, the more I realize how little I know. How many people here have seen Arabic written before or can understand Arabic? How many people? How many people don't understand it? Okay, the Arabs write from right to left. So how do you start reading Arabic and you go to the left? There's no way. How many people here can read Chinese? There is no, there's no grammar. They just put blocks. Yeah. They all, yeah. 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 My name is Fola Wo Chao Fola. Simple. My last name is Adiola. Wo Sin Adiola. No, 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 no. I had gone. He had come. He could have done. No, 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 no. They just, they just arrange it. And guess what? The Japanese then decide that they're going to arrive from the top. What do we know, really? What does anybody know? That tiny little bit that you know, and we're not going to rest? Keep learning. Keep learning. Keep learning. In the last 970 days, I have practiced Chinese every day. I doesn't know that I have practiced Chinese every day. But you know what? When I found him in this place, I also didn't know how much he has done to, to ruffle a still water. What do we know? Humility, learning, learning is for the humble. You know what you know. You don't know what the next person knows. But be humble to listen to the next person. I say, so, never let, never let that day come. When you are convinced, you know enough. May that day never come. Amen. For me, continuous learning, I have one of the fundamental principles guiding my journey as a leader. I'm never afraid to be a novice at something. As long as I don't stay a novice. If it's important to me, you know, you ask a question, and it sounded so dull, so stupid, but it's possible that that's the last time you'll ask that question, because somebody will provide you with answers, and you won't need to ask it anymore. You are a much better person than the person who says, I'm too big to have that question. They will embarrass me. And for the rest of your life, you carry that darkness. Um, for as long as I don't stay a novice, I'm fine. Each time I grow in knowledge, I become more adept at spotting opportunities and taking impactful action. When it comes to public impact, for example, I always knew I couldn't rest on my laurels. All the skills from my decades of work in the financial sector. Some of the knowledge was transferable, yes. But I also needed specialized knowledge. So five years before the pension reform invite came, and not knowing that it was coming, 
I had enrolled myself at the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies in Kuru, driven by a fervent interest in public policy. I didn't attend Kuru out of obligation. No, I was my own master. I asked to see Abu Salam, who was president, and I said to him, when, I, when it got to my turn, I said I would like to go to Kuru. They always had two slots called presidential. There is a name for it anyway. The president could send any two people to Kuru. I said I needed one of those slots. And he, he, he adjusted his chair. He said, that's why you came to see me. I said, yes. You want to go to Kuru? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's all right. I said, yes. He said, then go to Kuru now. I am sure that Kuru will benefit more from your being there than you from being there. I said, leave that matter. Me, I want to go uh, to Kuru. Yeah. I guess the president thought I came to ask for an oil block. I don't need it. I'm not saying it's bad to apply for an oil block, but that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to go to Kuru. And you know why I could go to Kuru? Because there were the, the IG of this world who I could leave the bank to. And guess what? I went to Kuru. And my deputy fell ill. At your time, you asked me to come to speak, to finish. And I came back from Kuru. And I go, Jay, you may never remember this. He walked into my office. I said, Why are you not going back? I said, I don't know. Tyo is ill. And he looked at me and said, so after all these years, you don't think we can run the bank? Why were you training us? Why were you pushing us here and there? I had a decision to make as a leader. <coughs> to abide by his admonition, or to sit and say, no, I don't trust them. I went back to Kuru, and they were running the bank. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Eswan is going to leave. If she likes, she will leave. If she doesn't like, she will leave. Because the reason she was able to sit there is that some people before her left. The job I did at that time, I'm not doing again, but it's been done. Aikoji is no longer the head of Access Bank. But there is Access Bank. Do you understand? That is what we are talking about when it comes to leadership at the end of the day. Um, I went to this school. I have to understand the landscape of Nigeria beyond the private sector that is conceited. We always think that the best resides there and we know everything, and that we are better organized than here. Until we get here, and we find that, oh my goodness, there's, there's so much they know here that we don't know, right? Yeah. It is not one or the other, no. It is one and the other. And the one must respect the other. And the other must respect the one. That is the only way we can, we can move forward. Therefore, when the pension bill opportunity came up later, I knew enough people who had met in different places, including Kuru, that could even call. I knew Yaya, I knew, I knew people in this place, so I wasn't a stranger. They didn't see me at that private sector man who was coming to tell them what to do. No. But that private sector man who was going in collaboration with them, explore what is best for the system. That is the only way we could have channeled the pathway to success. If I had come as the other one, you are enough to block it. And so many things are blocked, not because they are not good, but because of how they are, they are being presented. What is in front of us, our objective, and then learn how to so that when we go back home, we can tell our mother, you see this thing you sent me to Yaba to go and bring, this is it. But if you know what my eyes saw, 
as opposed to how I don't think anybody can drink that, you know. If you see the road, if you see this, and then somebody brings it, you know, what manner of public servant do you want to be? That that is a poser for you. Lead big graduates. The pursuit of knowledge will equip you to create effective and adaptable solutions, especially in your domain, where decisions and actions have far-reaching consequences. It is not the domain for reckless experimentation. So every decision must be weighed and considered for its impact on the people that you serve. Um, when the pension bill was done, I keep referring to it, I structured it in a way that was difficult to violate, reflecting not just my understanding of the policy, but of the country and its structures. The goal was not to create something perfect in theory, but something resilient and practical in reality. I couldn't have done that successfully without my time in Kuru, without seeking knowledge from other fora. Indeed, knowledge is what allows you to navigate intricacies like that. It is laudable that the civil service has availed you of, the, of an opportunity like it be. Now I know that it's been facilitated and catalyzed by the IPOJ, I, IPOJ Foundation. But guess what? Now, the onus is on you to continue seeking opportunities to deepen your understanding, whether through formal education, training, or practical experiences. As you do so, remain adaptable and receptive to new ideas and feedback. Any moment from now, I'll be 70. I know ChatGPTO, and we are, yeah, why not? Why not? Let that learning end when I end, not a day before. The last principle I'd like to highlight today is selflessness, which is interwoven with an impact mindset, integrity, and accountability. In the context of Nigeria's, Nigerian service, selflessness takes on a unique significance. As the P graduates, you are expected to champion transformative change. We've seen it here elaborated. Still, I must tell you frankly that the path of change is often fraught with challenges, as exemplified by the trials faced by Dora Nguyen during her tenure at NAPDA. In a system where self-interest can be prevalent, everybody is coming to argue that point for them. When the idea is presented, is how their companies are going to make money from it, and so on and so forth. Yeah, listen to them. Um, in a system where self-interest can be prevalent, you will face opposition and criticism as you try to do right. Yet, I urge you to choose selflessness and remain steadfast in your commitment to national good, no matter what obstacles. As you progress in your careers, the principle of selflessness should extend to advocating for fairness and a merit-based system within the service. This is how we uphold our achievements and pave the way for continual improvement and lasting positive change in Nigerian public service. You can deepen your commitment to selflessness by deliberately cultivating compassion for those who serve and lead. If you make a habit of considering the impact of your actions and inactions on people and communities, you'll be more likely to stand up for the causes that truly matter, even when they diverge from personal interest. This is the heart of transformative leadership. Leading not just with authority, but with empathy. One Pam said that gave the, one of the good speeches Spoke, I think it was you spoke about empathy. In my own journey, I have strived to embody the principle, this principle of selflessness. Whenever I'm presented with the opportunity to contribute to public good, I forgo any charges for the services rendered. When I was to ask me how much will I charge for pension reform, my answer was simple. Being called 
to have coined was sufficient or not. I will not charge anything. And even when I found myself in an institution where we needed money, I had enough in my pocket to bring out to support the process. So it was minus for me. Um, but I got called name. There was a secretary of the government of, of, the, of the Federation, a particular one. She remained nameless. When I was in the confab, we were going to be paid a large sum of money, and I wrote to him that as a habit, I don't charge federal government for this kind of work. Please don't pay me. And he called and he said, Oh, that's nice. Want to give money to Father Christmas? That was the statement he went to with the problem. I said, It's my habit. I didn't say it's his habit. <laughs> so that was how he saw it. But we have had all sorts of people. Just follow your path, follow your own path. Uh, I recognize that my financial position might lead some to view this decision as trivial. It's okay. There were wealthier people than me who got their own. I recognize, um, however, it's essential to understand that this choice is rooted in a consistent approach throughout my career. My employers were always strong enough to pay me, and I thank them to value service and impact over material wealth. What that looks like for you may be different, and I recognize it. But the key thing to understand is that selfless service is about making decisions that align with your integrity and commitment to public service. If you ever reach a point where you can no longer sustain your integrity within the system, then it is time to find a path that aligns with your ability to serve genuinely. As I advocate for placeness and integrity in public service, it is equally important to address a systemic issue that often challenges this principle, inadequate compensation. The reality is that for as long as the system fails to provide public servants with adequate means to live a decent life, the temptations to deviate from the path of integrity go stronger. Once an individual succumbs to these temptations, it can become a way of life, a cycle very difficult to break. Therefore, while I call upon you graduates who uphold the highest ethics, I also speak to the system governing our civil service. We must uphold a support structure that enables our civil servants to maintain their integrity. You passed that way before. That duty is now on you. We must assist people to maintain their integrity. This means advocating for fair wages, ensuring that they are adequately remunerated and on time, and creating a work environment that supports rather than undermines. The principle of good governance. By doing so, we provide our public servants with the foundation they need to serve our nation without the burden of financial struggle. I could just stood here today, this morning, or this afternoon, and proudly said, I'm a son of civil servants. Yeah. At a time when civil servants could pay the school fees of the kind of school that gave him the kind of education that he received. And therefore, I can say that a day today, without a struggle, we must put them in a situation where they can. Their husbands and their wives go to the same market. The schools are open to all our children, whether they are civil servants, or not. Why would they want their children to take the inferior education in the awareness of the superior education? And for you, graduates, why should there be inferior education and superior education? That is what we're asking for, a better society. Um, As I draw this speech to a close, 
I want each HDP graduate to take a moment for a sober reflection. You have learned a lot during your time in the program. And I've also spoken to you about the strategic and transformative. At this point, it's time to critically assess your motives and commitment to the service and the future of Nigeria. Are you ready and willing to truly embrace this often challenging but immensely rewarding path? Let me say it in simple English. Is this what I want to do? Am I cut out for this at all? The decision is as significant as the choice of a bride or a groom that they make before their wedding. It is better to, get, to take a step back now if you feel this responsibility is not for you than to go ahead to the detriment of our nation's future. Should you choose to proceed, however, please do so with the conviction that you are ready to transform lives and shape the future of Nigeria. Remember the true measure of your success in public service will not be in the well. And when I say well, because we are wealthy, it is the monetary aspect that I'm talking about. It's not going to be the wealth you amass or the accolades you receive. It would be about upholding integrity, continually learning, and embodying selflessness in your every action. It will be in the tangible, positive changes you bring about in the lives of the people that you serve. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look towards Nigeria's future, the potential and opportunities in our public service are immense. Civil service in Nigeria is ripe for innovation and progress. You, the lead big graduates, have the opportunity to be at the forefront of this transformation and steer this change. You have the opportunity to innovate processes, implement policies, and touch lives in profound ways. Imagine a vibrant, efficient, and responsive civil service. One where processes are streamlined and actions better the lives of citizens daily. As you embark on this phase of your career, I encourage you to see yourselves as agents of this change. Whether in education, in healthcare, infrastructure, or governance, each role you assume is an opportunity to make a significant impact. Carry with you the knowledge and skills you have acquired in the program and a deep-seated commitment to serve. Let this commitment be your guiding light, driving you to seek the success of Nigeria and every Nigerian. Today, start seeing your civil service career as a calling to build and transform by putting our nation's needs above your own, a calling to serve with integrity and to strive for excellence in all that you do. Thank you for your attention Thank you for your dedication and thank you for your commitment. The journey ahead is yours to shape and I'm confident that you will rise to the occasion and leave a legacy of positive impact. I congratulate you again and I wish you all the best in your future endeavor. Kindly allow me to end on a note of encomium for the people who have made this to happen. Thank you the Office of the Head of Civil Service of the Federation, led by Dr. Folash Adeyemi Often, good ideas are shared with people in positions such as yours. Often, these ideas are ignored. This is one that has seen the light of day. We must put in place every system and every structure that will keep it sustained. I'd like to thank the deep thinkers of this noble idea, Ayoje and Ufuwe, both of the Imokode Foundation, for their single-minded focus on governance in our country. This is not about donating cash or constructing edifices to be named after them. This is about a different kind of building building men 
and women who will, adequate, who will be adequately equipped to solve the challenges confronting our nation now and always. What a way to build. Thank you. And to everybody here, thank you for the privilege to witness this building. And very end. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a standing ovation for this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much.